Talk Network Entertainment. You're listening to the Adobe Talks podcast, The Business of Creativity, a series of high-level inspirational and educational sessions on how creativity unleashes inventive solutions that fuel the economy. In each episode, we'll be learning essential lessons through conversations with some of the brightest minds in the creative industries. I'm Angel Guerrero, founder and editor-in-chief of Adobe Magazine. Today, we have the honor of speaking with the principal author of the Creative Industries Law, a landmark piece of legislation set to uplift the Philippines' place in the global creative economy, the Honorable Congressman Tofte Vanessa. Thank you for being here at Hit Productions, and I know you've traveled the world as well supporting Filipino creativity. Mm -hmm. You just arrived from New York, I hear. Yes, I just got back from okay. a one-week trip and I was there primarily to support a friend, Red Concepcion, okay. who just debuted on Broadway as Amos Hart, Mr. Cellophane in Chicago. Wow, isn't that amazing? I mean, I New know. York, we have a Filipino that's uh, frontlining one of the uh, top shows in, in Chicago. Yeah, and I was telling a lot of um, our cast members in Spelling Bee, which is the musical I'm producing and it's premiering next month, that... Yeah, once upon a time, Red was just like you guys, like rehearsing for shows that are being staged here in Manila, and here he is now, a Broadway star. Now, you're often called one of the foremost champions of Filipino creativity. What we'd like to know is, where did it all start? I mean, you know, you have a bill that's out, passed into law, I believe at record speed. Mm. Um, what experience led to this be you know, becoming your main advocacy? Okay, so I would say I'm a policy maker by day and creative by night. Okay. I am also still very much a creative. I'm producing and directing for the stage. Uh, but yeah, as early as grade school, I was painting. I had a few exhibits. I was in showbiz. Uh, <laughs> as a child star, I did TV shows and films. What for... shows were you in? Uh, Over the Backhood. Oh, I see. I've, I've heard that before, yeah. Yeah, Over Billy Billionario, Highwell Ramble. So I had three sitcoms. I did a few films. Uh, one was Kung Kailangan Mo Ako with Sharon Conetta mm -hmm. and Rudy Fernandez, Pretty Boy. Um, Over the Backhood, the movie one, <laughs> parts one and two. Okay. Um, and then I did commercials as well. Um, you know, I have to now do a uh, look at all your, your reels, your portfolio <laughs> reels. Okay? Thankfully, they're not on YouTube, so <laughs> <laughs> nothing to blackmail me with. Uh, and then I worked for our school paper uh, in Coleo San Agustin. I was sports editor and, you know, into high school uh, when I transferred to Ateneo. I joined Highlights Magazine as a features writer and mm -hmm. then features editor and then my senior year as associate editor. And then in college, I didn't pursue writing for the school paper because the requirements to get into the guidon was just too tough. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I decided to forego my publishing dreams up until I got a call from Philippine Star to be a columnist for them. And so I did that for about 13 to 15 years. So what column did you cover? What? Uh, so I wrote for Young Star, okay, Young which Star. is the youth okay. section of the Philippine Star. So Tita Milet Manangkil is yes. my mentor mm. in publishing. And I wrote about anything and everything under the sun. And then when I left Young Star um, to focus on my... Uh, job in marketing for SM. Can you imagine that? You're actually in marketing. Yeah, I know. I produce <laughs> ad campaigns. Okay. I conceptualize promos. Uh, I made sure that collaterals uh, for my uh, business unit, Boys Teens Wear, were like, uh, displayed properly mm. uh, across all branches. And then soon after, um, my friend Raymond Ang who is now one of our global creatives. He's an editor for GQ now, GQ Magazine in New York. Uh, wow. He was then heading Young Star, uh, and then he asked me to come back. And then it was then that we were writing, um, or uh, writing columns that were a little bit more curated, mm -hmm. all with like a sort of like a new uh, thematic direction for Young Star. Uh, moving forward. So that was a very exciting time. I got to meet a lot of creatives 
from filmmakers to fashion designers to cartoonists, comic book creators, um, chefs. And that's why I sort of knew a, a thing or two about so uh, different creative industries. good, solid groundwork for you. Because just that exposure allows you to see the creative industry. And at a, at a young level, too. I'm right? Young yeah. stars. So you're talking to the rising stars of our creative industry. Exactly. So I think lifestyle journalism was really what opened my mind to like just like the the broadness and the scale of uh, the creative industries. But I didn't know it to be called creative, creative industries, industries then. Of course, it's of just course. like, oh, we're all creatives. We're all artists. Uh, we're all passionatis. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and then uh, soon after, some friends of mine uh, were putting up a theater company. And it was around 2005 when I did a summer workshop and I was bitten by the theater bug. So I was not only an actor, but eventually I became a partner in a theater company mm -hmm. called Nine Works Theatrical, which is now in its 15th year. Oh, congratulations. Yes, wow. thank you. We're doing Rent this year. Oh, wonderful. Uh, oh, I can't April, I look forward to that. Yes. From April to June. Okay. We did it back in 2010, 2011, years ago. And then in 2014, I was wanting to do like a different kind of theater. Mm -hmm. And that's how I put up Sandbox Collective. Okay. And then we have a full season this year. It's our 10th year anniversary. Yes, yes. I, I know you have a lot lined up. And I've watched a few of them um, a few years ago. Yes. Yeah, it's really uh, nice. So we're doing uh, Spelling Be the Musical yes. in February, Little Shop of Horrors nice. in July, okay. which I'm directing. Uh, and then in November, we're doing Tiny Beautiful Things, uh, which is based on the book, which became a Netflix special. Um, so, yeah, I'm just steeped in a lot of creative industries. You are, and you're also a politician, a congressman at that. Yes. But you know what, uh, Angel? It wasn't till the last Harvard executive course that I took. I took three okay. uh, to get the certificate mm -hmm. um, where we had this uh, one class on... Uh, the idea of competing commitments and how like people with uh, different things on their plate mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, in the concept of economics or opportunity cost one gets sacrificed for the other yes so I thought there had to be a distinction or dichotomy between my policy life and my creative life in fact when I'm in the yeah, people would like to know how you manage both right yeah um, no it's very difficult okay but I don't think I will be who I am if I didn't have both. And the bill wouldn't have happened or passed if you had didn't have both. If as I well. didn't have the passion for yeah. the substance of the bill, basically. That's right. So I thought before, if I was in the district doing my policy work or in Congress, then I had to sort of compartmentalize and put my creative life in a glass box. So it really started with a pandemic, and you know, all the creatives had a lot of time on their hands. Zoom as a <laughs> new form of technology came up about and everybody was able to dialogue and meet uh, from the comfort of their own homes mm -hmm. with their pandemic attires of like a formal top and like shorts <laughs> in the bottom sure. and yeah it's basically all these dialogues that led to uh, the first draft of the creative industry law and you were congressman then right I was on my second term okay and now in my third term okay and I guess that also wouldn't have happened if not for like that Harvard Kennedy School executive course that I took on competing commitment. Yeah, because, competing commitment. I like that idea, you know, how you resolve competing commitments. Yeah, because yeah. I felt that uh, maybe there was imposter syndrome coming into being a policymaker uh, advocating for the arts, culture, and what I didn't know to be creative industries, mm -hmm. and that I needed to know everything. Uh, and maybe that's my personality. Like, I want to go into something knowing that I'm going to win as opposed to putting yourself out there and just, like, letting it come to you. Uh, but I didn't realize that I could be working with fellow champions uh, to be able to uh, advocate and come up with uh, something or fight for a cause. And so, you know, eat from within our ranks uh, in the block that I formed in Congress called the Arts and Culture and Creative Industries Block mm, or okay. Achieve, we had economists. Yes, I remember that, yeah. We had economists like uh, Stella Kimbo, Sharon Garin, Joey Salceda, who were guiding the economic discussions, which I did not understand <laughs> sure. at all. But they're so important. But they're so important to <laughs> yeah. creative industry because it's industry. So Indeed. we need to be talking about revenue, GDP, 
uh, jobs, you know, intellectual property. I didn't know any of that. Um, Lauren Legarda was in the Congress then, yes. and she knew very well, like culture, heritage, and all of that are also part of the creative industries. Mm-hmm. And you know, I don't, I didn't necessarily know the Gamaba, the national artist, the programs of the NCCA. All I had was an intention to support and to help. And what I learned from that whole course in Harvard and, and that class in competing commitments is that I don't need to know everything. I just need to get people together in a room or at that point in a Zoom <laughs> to talk. Yeah. And the creative industry bill, which is now a law, is a, a result of all these discussions and conversations. So you're saying then that the state of, I mean, there's a lot of creativity going around. There's a lot of creative industries that are active in the Philippines, right? But why did you think it needed policy? Uh, well, of course, uh, it was really Paolo Mercado who okay. was like, and, you know, Ria Matute, yes. who was the executive director of Design Center, yourself, and yeah. all the people that I met who were really lobbying for some kind of policy support. But after the dialogues and conversations with the stakeholders, the heads of the different organizations in the creative economy, there needed to be an enabling policy in place because there was a lot of confusion within government and even outside as to what the creative industries even were. The automatic impression um, of a layman of creative industries is that uh, arts by N. Exactly. I mean, when people talk about creativity or creatives, it's art. Yeah. Drawing, uh, is, is that painting. Arts? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so is that uh, no? like theater? Is that like music? Uh, is that painting? Uh, well, in fact, arts are just like segments of the entire creative economy pie because you also have science and technology. You know, you have uh, design, which are functional, which mm-hmm. is antithetical to arts which are supposed to be of value outside of the function. But then there's now, you know, convergences of like art and design, such that even artists are, you know, finding expressions of their work through tote bags, merchandise. Yes. You know. And in, in functionality, in functional products as well. And functional, functional products. Objects, yes. So there's a lot of convergence happening across the different creative industries, maybe as a result of you know, the digital revolution, the internet of things, Mm -hmm. even visual arts now is like having non-fungible tokens, NFTs. Yes, NFTs, that's right. You know, so they're also venturing into like the digital space. So there were a lot of, uh, from those discussions, there were a lot of common pain points that could only be addressed with an enabling policy. And that is essentially the creative industry law. It was so nice to see the public and the private coming together with a desire to want to be able to uh, put forth a policy that would enable and um, protect and also accelerate uh, creative industries which a lot of them were already doing fine on their own mm-hmm. bef- before this uh, before yes, this law. Yes, some were, yeah. But, um, but back to your question earlier, generally there was a lot of confusion. So what the law first does is define what the creative industries are In and the first who place. is part of this sector. So there are nine, right, if I recall. From the 73, you're able to to put them under nine sectors, correct? What right. are they? Um, so th- that's nine domains. But before I get into that, mm. there were a lot of global frameworks that we could have you could um, adapted. Okay. And uh, we, we studied all from the UNESCO model, the WIPO, or the mm. World Intellectual Property Organization model, which inceptions creative industries as copyright-based industries. And in fact, the the 20... 20- 14 study that came out from IPOFIL using 2012 data inceptioned it as copyright based industries and that's Interesting. what was initially referenced during the uh, deliberations as uh, the one contributing 7% to our country's GDP then mm. um, and contributing a certain percentage to our labor force of course uh, hardly encapsulating really the entire creative workforce because there's a lot of freelance and those working in the informal sector. Yeah. Um, and so there was that WIPO model and then there was also the ONGTAD model. Yes. And I love that you mentioned ONGTAD yes. earlier because that's also what we felt would be most apt. 
uh, to the Philippine context as agreed upon by NEDA, which mm-hmm. is the National Economic Development Authority. It's a government agency yes. that does policy setting for our economic growth strategy. And so uh, with the UNCTAD model in place as uh, institutionalized in the law, we then followed the nine domains in the UNCTAD model, which are basically um, I started performing arts. Yes, you're, you're, I have a bias love. for that. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's the one closest to my heart. Uh, there's also visual arts. Uh, there's uh, publishing and printed media, very close That's to where, both our hearts. Yes. Uh, I started there. Uh, there's also digital interactive media, where mm-hmm. all the tech comes into play, and you know, software and game development. Yes, uh, growing. It's ever growing. Yes. Ever growing. There's audio and audiovisual media. Um, I guess close to my heart too, because I mean, I started out in film and TV. Uh, and my family, we have a we have a showbiz background since my grandfather founded Sampagita Pictures. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Uh, Sampagita Pictures, your gra- grandfather founded grandfather, it. Grandfather, Doc Perez. Wow. Yes, so yeah. it sort of it's runs already in, in the blood. blood huh? Runs in the blood. Uh, of course, there's design, of course. Um, uh, which is very broad because it covers object, meaning fashion and furniture. It covers place. Yeah. which is like architecture and then yeah. gear image design, making. Yeah. image making. There's also, um, you know, communication, like That's graphic right. design. Um, and then you have creative services, uh, also very close to my heart because like live events and, you know, uh, theater, you know, always segues to live events. Mm. Uh, that's their Kabuhayan showcase yes, yes, or yes. racket. <laughs> uh, but yeah, advertising is part of yes, creative it's services part of that, yeah. uh, and many others. Uh, cultural sites, is a domain, so it's the museums and the libraries. Yeah, uh, I see a lot of um, things picking up in that in that sector. Museums are, you know, coming alive, and they're better places to display art. It's well curated in right, nice venues, right. historical venues. Yeah. So I think people should come to the Philippines and check out our museums. Of course, it's it's really uh, improved over the past few years. Very actually. much so. Yes. Theaters. Uh, so that's all part of cultural sites. And then you have traditional cultural expressions. Mm. So you have craft. And I think what's most exciting, but also kind of hard to pin down or even just to codify uh, institutionally, is gastronomy. Yes. That's an interesting sector to include in creative industries. Very interesting. It's yes. not... Yes. How, how come it's there, you technically think? Technically speaking, it's not in the UNCTAD model. Yes. Uh, but a lot of our ASEAN neighbors have made a push to include food. In their creative economy counting, mm-hmm. uh, Indonesia, for example. Yes. And yes, so right. we decided to include it. And right now there is still ongoing deliberations as to who's included in gastronomy. There's a very interesting question at the Creative Tourism Conference last December in Bacolod uh, with the Slow Food uh, proprietors if Jollibee. Yes, is gastronomy. it's gastronomy, right. Uh, so if you define gastronomy as having a cultural aspect to it, that Jollibee has become a cultural icon for the Philippines and represents the best of the Philippines globally with the chicken joy and Jollibee. And even if it's considered fast food, it's even still if, the impact culturally, culturally and in terms of uh, Philippine branding and Philippine food. Philippine branding, yeah. Filipino hospitality. Yes. It's still co- very cultural in a way. So is Jollibee gastronomy, um, is the Sari Sari, is the Karinderia uh, gastronomy. So there's a lot of conversations still happening about gastronomy. Mm. Um, and so it's all very exciting. I don't know if I was able to cover all nine. Um, but if you I You did miss- a great job. I think you, you did. <laughs> <laughs> but if I missed out on any, they can always check uh, the law. Okay. It's RA11904. It's on Google. Yeah, so thank you on behalf of the Filipino creatives that there is now a bill and policies that will be in place. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's just a race against time. No, of course. But the we, fact that the bill was so well drafted, I mean, you know, I, I have to say. We needed to uh, really work with the private sector mm. to like uh, put political pressure, to lobby to our senatorial counterparts, right. to uh, work with the media, to raise awareness of the importance yes, yes. of this novel concept Mm -hmm. in terms of like uh, the landscape of Philippine governance. Uh, There is a new government agency Mm. created as a consequence of this law 
uh, which is called the Philippine Creative Industries Development Council. Okay. And it's attached to the DTI. It's okay. co-chaired by the DTI or the Department of Trade and Industry. That's good to know. Okay. And a uh, private sector representative. And uh, there are only 19 members in the council. Mm-hmm. Nine are private sector representing each of the domains. And 10 are ex-officio uh, government members in, from Department of Tourism, Department of Education, Department of Interior and Local Government, mm. Intellectual Property Office of the Philippines, NCCA, etc. But of course, a lot of government agencies wanted to be part of oh the council God, yes. too. <laughs> from the Film Development Council, of course, the yes. National Museum, of course. the National Book Development Board, That's right. the National <laughs> Council for Indigenous Peoples. Uh, you know, there were just so many government agencies that we couldn't accommodate because there's really a ceiling mm. as to the the members or the number of members to any kind of government entity mm. because it would be hard to muster a quorum yes, it would be hard yes. to transact business and we wanted to ensure that each of the sectors had a private sector representation yeah. uh, who will then have to uh, consult with their constituents and each domain is very broad mm. so imagine like for design if your representative is an interior designer they would have to make sure that the voices of the architect the urban planner, the landscape architect, the fashion designer, the furniture designer, the graphic designer are all represented yeah, by him at yes. the table. So, I see, I see. So, there's so one representative has a lot of responsibilities. Has a lot of uh, subsectors, uh, sectors, yeah, subsectors within, that they have yes. to meet with constantly. Mm. Uh, so there's that membership to the council, even the... Um, even the uh, definition of creative industries as to uh, which framework should be uh, adapted into the And you also need context. to focus, correct? I mean, if you have nine, I'm sure even with your government budget, you can't, I don't know, huh? you're spreading it thin, right? You're only right, starting right, right. to get grants. You know, like you want to be supporting support all. all. Yeah. Uh, but, but essentially, that's where the roadmap comes into play. Okay. Uh, the first mandate of this Creative Industry Council is to come up with a development roadmap for the creative sector in the short, medium, and long term. And uh, while each uh, domain or creative industry in, under the domain have to have their own roadmap, essentially we all have, uh, the Philippines needs to have one comprehensive roadmap for developing the entire creative economy so that we can hit our 2030 goal. What's the size of our creative workforce? I mean, I... It's Seven, huge. I forget. Uh, so, Seven million, twelve million. I so we remember. deliberating on the measure mm-hmm. in Congress. We are working on that uh, twenty fourteen. Uh, yes, it's still twenty fourteen. Very outdated, information. Yes. Very outdated information because mm. there was no attempt to sort of do a, a a revision or like an update. So what we did was even before the bill was passed, we already commissioned. Uh, a survey with the Philippine Statistics Authority. Yes, PSA. Yeah. Uh, which we funded in the 2022 budget. And uh, the results of which were published early 2023, way after the bill had become law, that uh, in 2022, the creative industries generated 1.6 trillion pesos for the economy. See how big we really are. Which translates to 7.3 three percent of gross domestic gross product of or GDP, GDP of the country's GDP. GDP that's huge right I mean compared to other industries and other sectors seven percent of GDP it's substantial very substantial just 1.7 percent behind agriculture and we in in some ways we're under leverage the creative industries we're it's under- never brought to the table right that uh, it contributed so much to the country's GDP exactly yeah. I mean uh, there's no department to speak of mm-hmm. uh, it's a council. Um, it's not even a commission or an administration. It's a council. Um, and the resources allocated for the implementation of the law. In year one, the 2023 budget had 410 million pesos for the creative industry law. Uh, year two, 2024, the budget is around 200 million, so even lower. Lower. 
Um, so I don't think there's a parity uh, okay. insofar as contribution vis-a-vis resources being allocated to it. So there's still a lot of work to be done, right? So if there was something else you needed to do in terms of legislation, I know you have this council, or or do you think the council will, will suffice? There needs to be institutionalized funding uh, mm. for the creative industry law that goes beyond the national budget uh, because the national budget, there's always constant you know, lobbying, you have to do the whole um, dog and pony show to convince the economic managers to allocate resources for this sector. But if there is an earmarked funding, like let's say with some kind of tax levy, like uh, earmarked collections that go directly to the implementation of the law, I think that would be most ideal. Okay. So in in, in a few words, tell mm. us what is the creative industries, the Philippine Creative Industries Development Act that you put is now put into law. Hmm. Okay, first it defines the creative industries. Second, it creates the government agency mandated to uh, support and develop the sector. Mm-hmm. Third, it institutionalizes a lot of support programs okay. for the creative industries from education, uh, which is section 17 of the law, and mandates DepEd, CHED, and TESDA. Which, which is, is education the and then education the technology. And technical vocational. Yeah, yeah. To synergize with industry so that the kind of uh, human resources we're churning out in our uh, education institutions are attuned to the needs of the sector. Because we found out from our meetings that, you know, firms need to spend another 20, 30% just to retrain. The workforce that they're yep. going to hire. Yep. So that means those that are coming out from the arts and design track and even our higher educational institutions, they're not being taught the right skills or what the skills that are needed by the market. So there's education. There's also uh, uh, marketing, marketing support. Mm-hmm. It's being able to join all of these trade shows, trade fairs abroad. It's uh, developing markets uh, not just internationally, but also domestically. And so I think uh, what's important is uh, the law also defines clear KPIs or key performance indicators. And that is basically uh, revenue, yeah, jobs, contribution to GDP, currently standing at 7.34%. Uh, uh, what I failed to mention earlier from the Philippine Statistics Authority study is that uh, 7 million Filipinos... Are in the creative industry. Are industries. in the creative industry. That is massive. That's twelve point. Imagine 5. taking care of that community and making sure they flourish within their own industry. Right. And is supported with through the law and through funding. Yeah. And through marketing. Right. Um, wow. That's twelve point tremen- five percent of total of the, labor force. Uh, imagine that. So that's massive. That's massive indeed. Um, so jobs, revenue, GDP, export. Mm. We want to be exporting more of our creative output. Uh, we are, based on the UNCTAD uh, study in 2018, we are sort of middling in ASEAN in terms of exporting our creative goods because of a host of problems. Mm. You know, logistics, mm. high power costs, a weak manufacturing base, uh, over-regulation, etc. In fact, if you want to work in the furniture industry, you need to obtain 17 permits that's it's crazy. just overly yeah. burdened with regulation. Yeah. Red, red tape, right? Red He's, tape. You're trying to remove that as well. Trying yeah. to remove that. Uh, if you are a furniture maker, it's more costly to ship your product to Manila than to Singapore. Doesn't make sense. That doesn't yeah. make sense. <laughs> um, so uh, there, we of course ease of doing business. So we want. To, so we are middle of the road uh, in terms of exporting our creative goods, but we are number one in ASEAN in exporting our creative services. Uh, basically all of the online all of the online, online creative, creative work, work. That's even being advertising is considered creative services. Advertising, right? uh, even you know uh, architects, interior designers, sure. they're, they're able to service clients. So we're abroad. leading ASEAN in that. We're leading in ASEAN. That's amazing guys. Did you hear that? <laughs> we're leading uh, Philippines is leading ASEAN when it comes to creative services. Yeah. So so definitely we need to improve on our exports. Mm-hmm. We also need to ramp up on our foreign direct investments. Uh, 
okay. uh, our investments in the country um, to really prop up the creative industries. But what do you think, I mean, in terms of creative industries, I, I mean, you mentioned quite a few, but and there's a lot of potential, hmm. but which creative industry do you think is under leverage or needs and has more potential for the country right now? And how do you think you can best support it? I know you like performing arts. Mm. Is it performing arts? Uh, of you course, I'm always going to uh, wave the flag, wave the flag of performing, for arts. performing arts. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, we have so much potential in um, creative services. Mm. Uh, okay, still, to, yeah. to even ramp that up further. But uh, I think also, uh, and the final uh, KPI of the law really is intellectual property. Okay. Generating more Filipino IP. Original content. Original because a lot of the work Filipino we do, content. creative services, is actually we're using the IP of other countries and right. rendering. And Correct. that's where we get money from that, right? Correct. The revenue comes in that way. So it's not our IP. It's somebody else's it's IP. Somebody else's like doing IP. Disney, Pixar, and all of that. Right. Marvel. Right. We, do, we render it for them, but it's not our IP. Right. So we're trying to encourage more Filipino content, right? We create our own characters, our animation, our that's you can IP. You can actually right. have intellectual yeah. property protection. Yeah. So I wouldn't say it's domain specific as yeah. to the highest potential, but mm. more of like as a as a possible investment uh, of the country in so far as developing the sector. We need to develop more Filipino IP. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Our music, music, you know, our animated characters, you know, our... anime, you know, Trece, did Trece, so well of course, yes. From like a graphic novel, it became like an animated series. Mm -hmm. It went number one in a lot of territories. Uh, even our films. Uh, I think right now, uh, because of the changing uh, consumption habits of the Filipino audiences uh, from um, you know theatrical screenings to you know uh, uh, streaming platforms and that because theatrical streams uh, screenings have sort of declined uh, since the pandemic and the maturation of streaming platform then uh, producers are producing content uh, with the end view of eventually selling it to a streaming platform and when streaming comes to mind, the audience is there really global. And so the which content... Which is marvelous, right? Which is marvelous, I mean, it, right? it democratizes creative content. So right? access is democratized, but also the quality needs to step up. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah so you can't do like the usual uh, content that appeals to uh, mass audiences that usually consume the content from the theaters. Because of course, ticket prices in cinemas now have become so expensive. Yeah, I just watched a, a movie yesterday. It's it's quite expensive. So as you said, no, we were talking about it that regular Filipinos don't have access to movies because it's just above their pay scale to buy a ticket to the cinema. But I think also their exposure content has, has also uh, been democratized because of subscriptions to streaming platforms. Yeah, Netflix platforms. and all so of that. So yeah. they see the they kind see of the... quality content that uh, they would uh, pay for or you know spend their hard earned money for and so everything from from film to books to even live performances uh there's an opportunity to really double down on the generation of filipino ip towards uh what i call an ip ecology that's an interesting concept, and I think it should be encouraged. I mean, we do consume a lot. I mean, even you talk about bringing in rent, right? That's a, a global play. Mm. Uh, how nice would it be if another market takes on the Filipino play? Correct, like right? Yakov Ages or like yes. El Bimbo. I mean, who's to yes, say that these it's not, yes. OPM jukebox musicals can't be performed abroad, abroad. translated in their language? Correct, yes. Uh, that our, like, uh, the works of Nick Joaquin... Yes, uh, indeed. or all of our like national artists for literature can't be performed abroad the same way that we perform Shakespeare and Chekhov here in the country. So again, it's really uh, changing this uh, mindset of the Filipino creative and content creator that uh, pang local lang tayo. I think right now they have to think that everything they make is for a global audience Correct. in the first place. Correct. And right I think at the beginning. Yeah. With the shifting uh, trends right now in creative economy, uh, uh, to go global is to be hyper-local. So that is a radical uh, shift in paradigm uh, in the Filipino creative that is still sort of nascent and it's like still 
um, we're still coming into our own uh, in terms of like our content being worthy of uh, having a space in the global arena. Um, it's it's changing that mindset, obliterating the inherited uh, shame uh, and uh, parang hiya that we have. Um, or even low confidence. You low know? confidence. I think that's uh, something we don't think we create enough or good enough work for the rest of the world to yeah. see. No, kasi yeah. parang ano eh, the Filipino diaspora are... Uh, you know, they are second, third generation immigrants and, you know, they're forebears. And I think this is more clearly articulated in that episode of Taste the Nation mm. of Padma Lakshmi in season two when they cover Filipino cuisine in the Bay Area. Okay. I, it, I haven't seen that, but yeah, I'll look at it. It's a 30 minute, it's a 30 minute watch. It's so emotional. Mm -hmm. And I was like crying buckets. Humahagol gol is the term. I humahagol gol because I felt the emotions of all of these uh, Filipino chefs mm -hmm. who are wanting to make better representation of our culture through their food. And the first generation migrants, and maybe it's true of like uh, our previous generation of creatives, like there was this uh, sort of idea or feeling that, you know, Filipino food is brown. Yeah. It's oily. Mm. Um, it's something not to be proud of. Mm. But the second, third generation of creatives, the, the millennials, the Gen Zs, they are proudly wearing the flag, uh, proudly uh, opening up their Filipino restaurants. And Filipino cuisine is slowly picking up, especially in the States, in New York. Right? In, the, I mean, there's... in the global landscape. That's right. So from that to, you know, Dali de Leon... Uh, you know, yes. being nominated for a BAFTA, a Golden Globe, now working with Nicole Kidman, you know, from Clint Ramos, who was like winning uh, Tony Awards left and right for his work, uh, you know, Red Conception, who just opened on Broadway. I mean, the Filipinos are achieving leaps and bounds, uh, you know, even in advertising, winning can, uh, yes. Gigil, yes. Uh, you know, uh, filmmakers. Uh, winning, uh, f uh, you know, in Cannes, in Venice, you know. We're doing well. We're like on the cusp of greatness. We're in the cusp <laughs> of greatness, you know. I always say that. Come on, let's, you know, jump. <laughs> so we just need to jump. And yeah. these people who are strategically positioned abroad, uh, they are so ambassadors they okay. are ambassadors uh bretman rock yes yes always promoting filipino <laughs> right always promoting filipino in his content yeah you know? they are all they are ready to support filipinos who want to uh penetrate the global market in fact mmff mm -hmm. uh, they're now in which LA. is the metro manila film festival yes they're now in la because all films are being shown in la as part of like the first ever a Filipino film festival, mm -hmm. global Philippine festival, or something I like see. that. So, our nice. content can go global, but our uh, our creatives need to sort of uh, get over the reductionist mindset, mindset that we yeah. have. That like even me. That's when a good I lesson to learn and to to you know just share this you know to tell Filipinos to stop that. Be yeah. more confident. Get your yeah. work out there. Be seen. And to a standard. You to know what standard. the standards, uh, yes. what you're up against, right? Exactly. So, I mean, it's all of these things that I feel like, you know, we're starting to see uh, tectonic shifts in, yeah. the, in the domestic and the global creative economy. There is a lot of internationality happening now with Filipino content, even um, Drag Race. Yes. Even Drag Race yes. Philippines, yes. and you have global fans chiming in That's true. on just how hilarious. My daughter and, loves that, yeah. And how creative <laughs> our our drag queens are here in the country. So I think it's really all of these things coming into a headway, and we cannot be left behind because while um, on their own they're doing so well, we cannot accelerate to sort of the dream or to the full potential of the creative economy if there's no public private synergy. Uh, I think what's important to to share in all of these discussions is that uh, while we look towards South Korea as like, wow, they seem to have gotten their act together. Mm. Um, and the South Korean government's uh, 
uh, pivot towards uh, content industries or creative industries happened in the 90s. That's why it's good now that the Philippines has the government's backing behind yes. creative industry. So it's official. It's now official. Yeah, it's not like random organizations doing their own thing and different uh, groups like NCNC, NCCA and doing their own. The overall Philippine government is it's now a whole of support. government. Yes. Uh, effort to develop yeah. the sector from finally <laughs> from department of tourism yeah you know, it's like oh. and dti is the lead organization so that's department of trade and industry right. it's going to bring revenue for us so right. amazing what your bill has done it's you know, consolidated the idea of creative industries yeah. they're not in silos anymore right we're and one big community exactly yeah. and you know from dot when we had our creative tourism summit last year in December, we introduced a new tourism product mm. to the tourism mix, which is creative tourism. And then we're going to have a part two for that where we will uh, basically have a conference on how we can leverage creative output for tourism outcomes from film to like, you know, hosting esports events here in the country and the, the yeah, and thousands. You also, and you also have regional art residences, right? Regional I mean, arts you had the Anak Banwa mm. and um, in the grander scheme of things, how does that add value? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely it's really empowering the regions. Yeah, so so when, that, when we talk about regions, it's outside of Metro Manila. Outside yeah. of Imperial Manila, <laughs> as it's yeah. always referenced. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and we need to really decentralize creativity and we need to empower the local grassroots creatives so that eventually there can be industries in the regions that they don't have to uproot themselves from their locality, where they studied, where they grew up, where their friends are, uh, where their friends live and their families and have to, you know, migrate to Manila and you know, duke it out here in an oversaturated labor market for the creative industries. Uh, we need to be able to spread out the development uh, of creativity across the regions. And I think uh, since you talked about you know creative cities earlier, obviously uh, you know Paolo made a play uh, for the Baguio. UNESCO Creative City for Baguio in 2017. That's right. Cebu followed suit in 2019 right. for design. What's next? What other city? 2023. This uh, last year, Iloilo got Ilo, in Ilo. Okay. Uh, in the gastronomy category. So the next cycle is 2025. So right now, a lot of cities are getting so inspired. <laughs> yeah. They are preparing for their bids. Uh, they are completing Wonderful. their broken ecosystems uh, to be able to provide provide as much value uh, to the bid and also to their own. I think also when you become a creative city, it's not enough to be, I'm a creative city, but every year you have to maintain that status. Right. Otherwise you lose it. It has to be a sustainable uh, practice within the city to maintain that, whether it's gastronomy or folk art or whatever, right? Yes. Every I mean, year. So that, that in a way, uh, how to call it, provides a f strong foundation for right. every city to be in it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. name the creative uh, city. Just, yeah. uh, basically, it's an uh, no, urban renewal, yes. urban regeneration, sustainable really development. Good. So we're excited for the 2025 okay. uh, applicants and whoever will be endorsed. Hopefully, we'll get more into that okay. network. Um, but also with the law and the institutionalization of the Philippine Creative Cities Network, uh, we're just excited to work with local authorities, from mayors, governors, uh, to uh, sort of seed all of these creative ideas and strategies that they can leverage for their own uh, socioeconomic outcomes. And there's really a lot. Yeah, when you bring a lot of it and they realize they can monetize and they make money and regenerate even their economy through creative, creative creativity, culture, um, art, um, you know, designers that right. can share their graphic design excellence in, say, the Vow or Cebu. Exactly. It'd be quite tremendous. I mean, the ROI on a film incentive is one is to eight. So if they just spend like, you know, like one million pesos for a film grant, the return to their local economy is eight million. So can you imagine different provinces or cities coming up with their own, own film yes, incentives, yes. coming up with their own film commissions, uh, encouraging advertising uh, and film industries and even global uh, film industries to shoot in their localities. And already that gives so much uh, livelihood, it gives so much revenue, and with the case of Karamoan, it even improved mm. their educational outcomes. Uh, the students in the public schools 
now have this uh, calibration that they need to be good in English because eventually they're going to be working for uh, a tourism in an English-speaking market. And so even that puts some kind of exquisite pressure in their development. And that's just for film. Abandoned buildings can be... Uh, creative hubs, yes. Can be adaptively reused to be yeah. creative hubs, mm -hmm. to be co-working spaces for freelancers. Yes. Uh, visual art can totally transform abandoned spaces to become tourism sites. Uh, you know, festivals can be more... Uh, they can be more rooted and grounded and more competitive if they leverage on creativity and the entire creative economy from food to fashion to craft uh, to even the performing arts. Uh, yeah, there's so, so we, much you can yeah, do. Yeah, so we need the whole country to, uh, you know, ride onto this wave. Um, this wave of creativity. Yeah, uh, across, I mean, in every small city and island, our over 7,000 islands should get all involved, and right? And design. And design. <laughs> yeah, and so to your question about Anakbanwa earlier, yeah. I think what Anakbanwa uh, arts residency, which is our residency program in the mm -hmm. Gupan, was able to do is bring creatives from all over the Philippines to the Gupan, um, capacity build, upscale network with our local creatives. So now they're all friends on Facebook. They're like messaging each other. They're like doing collaborations even without me being aware that these are happening. They're now being invited to like exhibit in Manila and other like parts of the country. And so all it needed was like that opportunity for them to meet mm. and get to know each other and then want to collaborate. And so uh, I think uh, it's opportunities that are uh, that need to be unlocked and unleashed for our, our regional creatives. Now with and everything to be able to that, showcase them as and with well. everything that we do, I mean, as a country, when you have to invest, mm. correct? So you have to invest in create the creative economy, creative industries, mm -hmm. um, provide them tools, technology, skills, education, right? Mm -hmm. We know that the government sector, as you know, it, this is a new bill. Mm -hmm. They're putting some emphasis and some funding, mm -hmm. but it's moving along. Yeah. But how can the private sector and brands help support this creative industries bill and help the uplift the creative industries? Right. So uh, recently we partnered with the Ayala Group mm -hmm. and then they hosted a uh, Fiesta Haraya, which is the year-end creative industry festival mm -hmm. in one of their malls. And uh, that was basically a, a conversation that happened between myself and Mariana Zobel de Ayala. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I endorsed uh, her team to DTI and then they talked and months later the festival happened. And so there is really an opportunity for a lot of big brands, multinational companies. To yeah, I mean, support. from my side, like in advertising, there are a lot of brands that want to do a lot of things for the creative industries, oh, right, but yeah. they don't know what. Mm. You know, like uh, can you can you pitch a film story so mm. that a brand can take it on or or be a patron for it or even right. make it part of their brand story? Right. So you know. To your point about networking, I think private sector can network more with creative industries and different organizations, different talents to at least, you know, they do have budget. I yeah. mean, it's just where do they place the budget to support creative industries? Right. So it's really, uh, you know, linking up with DTI as, at the soonest mm, possible okay. time because right. they would be aware of like what the gaps are okay. in terms of like funding and mm -hmm. the kind of support that's needed by creative mm. industries and creative industry players. So link up with DTI, reach out to uh, Secretary Fred Pascual or the Focal for Creative Industries. That's USEC Rafaelita Aldaba. Yes. Their emails are on the website. Yeah. Um, and, um, and reach out directly to creative industry players themselves. I mean, uh, you know, one of the you know, advertising, uh, print, I always say, are like the biggest enablers mm -hmm. of creative industries other than being creative industries themselves. And advertising are basically, uh, br they serve as a bridge between multinationals and, you know, the audiences. And in this case, maybe the creative industry players. Like there's an opportunity to do um, very out-of-the-box 
uh, intru- brand intrusions, like we were talking about, like podcasts earlier, yeah. like mm-hmm. now being monetized through advertising. Uh, you can like PETA, which is a leading theater company, has done such marvelous work in working with brands and getting the plays and the actors to mention the brands cheekily. <laughs> yeah, there's cheekily. a way of bringing brand mention. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cheekily in, in a the fun show. Way, yeah. uh, whether it was Walang Aray or recently Tabing Ilog, the musical. Um, so brands can work with the entire creative economy. There's so many creative ways. Sky's the limit. Okay. Um, I well, think let, let synergies... Adobo try to help all, as well, uh, you know, put the communities together only because we know what brands are capable of. Yeah. And I really want to support all that you're doing in the creative industries, Toph. Thank you very much Thank for you. this conversation. Now, so my last question would be, you know, what to you is an ideal future for our creative industries? And how soon do you think we can achieve this vision? Mm, okay, so, uh, well, my ideal future, really, for the creative industries is, one, I always go back to the youth. I always go back to okay. uh, the children who are our future, as the song goes. <laughs> uh, the creative youth... Uh, once upon a time, I was a creative youth who had aspirations of wanting to be a creative and being told, you know, by my parents that, you know, there's no money in the arts, there's no money in creativity. Why yes. don't you go pursue like uh, a legitimate quote unquote profession, profession you know, yeah. like being being a lawyer, being a doctor, being businessman. a businessman. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we want to be able to change that mindset because. I think what's in the way then as compared to ho- what hopefully will happen now is that there is really more whole, not even government, but a whole of nation support for creativity and the creative industries. It's the whole of nation uh, seeing the value of creatives and what they are able to bring to the table. Um, I want, I imagine a future where a creative youth, when he or she tells their parent that you know they want to be a creative like the parents will jump up and down and joy like yes yeah yes that's my that's been my dream for you all along and i think that's the sort of like the creative future that we imagine and we envision um while it's like a creative future like an idea of creativity i also associate youth to the future and so i go back to the youth um so we hope to be able to do that hope to be able to uh, address all these pain points so that uh, when they get into the industry, it's not this like inherited like, uh, well, that's really the case that, you know, if you're going to produce a film, you need to earn three times your investment just to break even. It doesn't have to be that mm-hmm. way. Or like if you're going to be in the performing arts, like, okay, you're only... Less get... risk, lower risk. Lower yeah. risk, yeah. more support. Uh, we want uh, them to have sustainable careers when eventually they get that's why the concept of creative economy comes in Mm. it's not just creativity and people Mm. it's where does the economy part come in how do you monetize how do you make a sustainable career right so i like the fact that um there's a really big push from the government private sector to push create the idea the concept of creative economy and focusing on the youth as i know your your slogan is the future is Is creative. creative so um thank you very much for sharing that with us uh so here's to bringing filipino creativity to the world thanks so much for the conversation kong Tof, and cheers. cheers i am filled with hope <laughs> <laughs> and optimism for our creatives and i hope our audience is too well thank you for listening in and watching this episode of adoba talks podcast with our very special guest congressman Tof devanesha the Adobe Talks podcast, The Business of Creativity, is available on Spotify, SoundCloud, and on Adobe Magazine's platforms. The Adobe Talks podcast, The Business of Creativity, is produced by Adobe Magazine, The Word on Creativity, in partnership with the Pod Network and recorded in partnership with Hit Productions. Tune in next week for another insightful conversation with one of the brightest minds in our creative industries. The opinions of podcast creators, hosts, and guests are not necessarily reflective of the official stance of the Pod Network Entertainment, its hosts, or other network programs. The content created by the people behind the podcast is personal and not meant to harm any religion, ethnicity, group, organization, company, or individual.